Hello everyone and welcome back. Now, the past few videos we've been introduced to the wave equation. And what we've seen with the wave equation and the heat equation is that in certain circumstances, especially in one spatial dimension, we can solve this using separation of variables. Now, a key piece of separation of variables is that in the sort of simple setting, we keep finding partial or ordinary differential equations that look like this, these harmonic linear oscillation equations. Now, in some cases, they become a little bit more complicated if we have non-homogeneous equations or if we have radial variables, but more or less, we get these second order differential equations that involve an unknown lambda here. Remember, the lambda comes from separation of variables, right? And it comes from literally separating out time and space and having fractions of each one of them equal to each other, meaning that they must be constant. The important aspect here is that we have two unknowns, right, in one equation. We need to find lambda and we need to find a function phi, right? So lambda here would be a real number and phi would be a continuous function on the interval zero to L. Now, technically it should be at least twice differentiable because we need two derivatives here, but we're not gonna bog ourselves down necessarily with the spaces that these things belong to. I just want you to notice that, you know, this is a, a two part problem. Things become intertwined together. And we've already seen that lambda is very, very critical for a number of different pieces in the separation of variables. First of all, it helps us satisfy boundary conditions, right? So another thing here is that we have and boundary conditions. So I didn't write them down because you, there's all kinds of different ones we could have, right? We could have Dirichlet boundary conditions, we could have Neumann boundary conditions, we could have Newton's law of cooling, we could have mixtures of them, right? So there are boundary conditions that help us figure out what the value of lambda is or what the values of lambda are. Now, Let's put this in a more general formulation. This second derivative is a linear operator, right? So again, we've talked about linear operators before. We've seen that they're basically sort of generalizations of matrices. We call an operator as a function on functions, right? So this, if we rewrote it like this, minus lambda, phi, this is maybe ax equal to lambda x, right? It is an eigenvalue or an eigenvector equation. So this tells us that lambda is an eigenvalue of the linear operator. In this case, our linear operator is the second derivative. Now we have the minus here sort of by convention. We've seen this over and over and over again. But then this also tells us that phi is an, now it's not an eigenvector, it's an eigenfunction. This is the sort of beautiful thing about mathematics is you can put eigen in front of anything and it sort of makes sense. So here now, because we're talking about functions, this is an eigenfunction, but it's the same basic idea. And this right here is what we call an eigenvalue problem. Okay, so that means that there's some linear algebra involved here, right? Or at least some infinite dimensional linear algebra because we're talking about functions, which is uh, what we call functional analysis. Now, let's look at an example of places where eigenvalue problems come up in PDEs, in more general settings. Let's do heat flow. So heat flow, back to the heat equation, on a non-uniform non-uniform rod. Okay, so this is this sort of general heat equation that we saw at the very beginning of this lecture series. So we haven't actually solved this equation. Uh, where are we? Partial x plus q. Remember, q is some uh, external heat source. But this was our sort of general heat equation, right? These could be functions of space and time. 
in, uh, in our case, we're going to assume everything is only just a function of space, and that helps with separation of variables. If, there, if uh, C rho and K naught and Q, if these things are functions of space and time, then uh, you're going to have a lot of trouble with separation of variables. So for now, we can assume that they maybe depend on space, uh, but no time, okay? But here's what we'll also do. Let's suppose, let's suppose that Q is, let's say, a scalar multiple of the current heat or the current temperature U, right? So that means that the heat source, the sort of heat generated at any point in space is proportional to the current temperature at that point in space, right? Alpha also might depend on X, right? It might, uh, you know, you might be some sort of physical properties of the rod that you want to build in. Maybe it's a better insulator in some areas and it's a worse insulator in other areas. You know, these things can all sort of depend on X. But the question is, when would this actually take place, right? When would we actually have this kind of situation? Well, Maybe not necessarily for uh, heat flow on a rod, but if you were measuring the temperature of a chemical reaction, again, we've talked about diffusion before. We've seen that this thing can also model chemical pollutants or chemical reactions. Then if alpha is positive, so alpha is greater than zero, this gives you what's called an exothermic, exothermic chemical reaction. And essentially what that says is the higher the temperature, the more heat is going to be generated, right? So you have this, this sort of self-reinforcement that's being driven through this uh, chemical reaction. Similarly, you can have what's called an endothermic. So an endothermic chemical reaction. And that's when alpha is negative. And what that means is the higher the temperature, the more it sort of dissipates, right? This means that the chemical reaction would remove heat, right? Because this thing is negative, it's pulling the, the, the Q here is pulling you down. And so your chemical reaction is removing heat from your rod. Okay, so let's imagine we've got this kind of heat source here. And let's use separation of variables, right? Okay, so that means that, you know, standard separation of variables asks me to break my solution up into a function of space and a function of time. Let's actually work through all of it just so that we do it once so that later on we can kind of skip to the, to the interesting pieces. Okay, the left-hand side here, we've got a time derivative, so it's C rho phi of x and then dh dt. Okay. And then on the left-hand side, okay, so none of these partial derivatives are affecting uh, the h term, so we can just pull that outside, h of t. And then now we have just standard derivatives because we've separated things out. dh dx. And then plus, and here's our our endo or exothermic chemical reaction term on the end here. Again, C, rho, K naught, and alpha could depend on space as well if you wanted to. Uh, here I'm just suppressing the dependence. I'm only putting dependence on the, the pieces from separation of variables just to emphasize where they sort of came up in here. When you separate this out, you would get H prime over H, right? So I'm just using prime for derivatives here. I'm hoping you can kind of keep track of these things. And now I get 1 over C rho uh, phi and then D dx K naught uh, D oh sorry this should be phi in here D phi dx and then plus alpha C rho and now everything here is a function of x, everything here is a function of just t, so we do our standard separation of variables. We set this equal to minus lambda, right? I'm not saying we can solve it, but I just want you to know where these things come up. So the first equation we get is our usual time 
equation, right? H prime is equal to minus lambda H. We can solve that very, very easily, right? All the solutions are exponential. The most important and critical piece is this eigenvalue lambda. If it is positive, heat will decay. If it is negative, heat will blow up. So really, you know, the eigenvalues play a critical role in the time dynamics here. But those eigenvalues, they come from the spatial part of the system. They come from this piece right here. K naught d phi dx. Um, and then plus alpha uh, phi. And sorry, plus lambda c rho phi is equal to zero. Here, we've got another eigenvalue problem, right? Here is the eigenvalue. Here is my linear operator. It's a little bit more complicated than before, right? It's not just a second derivative. You can uh, check that this thing is linear using the properties that I gave you though. Now you also have a weight applied to this. So it's actually what's called a weighted eigenvalue problem. The C and rho here, they're sort of multiplying your eigenvalue and your function. That's okay. We can, in general, uh, handle these things. But this is a general eigenvalue problem that arises from heat flow on a non-uniform rod. So we would like to be able to solve this, or we would at least like to know that a solution exists, right? Because if we can prove a solution exists, we can put it maybe onto the computer and we can look for it, right? Or we can use a, a sort of maybe asymptotic methods or some, some sort of clever mathematical tricks in order to try and investigate what solutions this thing might look like. We still have to know that a solution exists because we have to know that we're looking for something. Okay, just as another sort of very, very simple example, just to show you another place where these come up, let's look at circularly, so circularly symmetric heat flow. We did this as an example already, all right? We did, uh, we, well, we solved the Plasse's equation on a disk, which turns out to be basically the same problem. But here we have, let's just use our sort of standard, really simple heat equation. So here I've got just a constant K here. This is the one we did separation of variables on. But I'm putting it in polar coordinates and it's circularly symmetric, so it only depends on the radial variable. So that means that my second derivative here becomes the radial variable second derivative, so here I've got r partial u partial r. Okay, so this is circularly symmetric heat flow and separation of variables, so I'll do s o v, separation of variables, would make me assume that I have say phi of r and h of t, and that comes from the fact that the spatial variable now is the radial variable, right? In this case, of course, I get basically the same thing that I just saw above, okay? So I'm gonna let you do the, the putting this thing in and doing the separation of variables. We get two equations. H prime is equal to minus lambda H. There it is again. So the time decay or the time growth is determined by the eigenvalue. But the eigenvalue is determined by an eigenvalue problem that looks like this. R d phi dr plus lambda r phi is equal to zero. So you try and try and find or try and derive that yourself. But again, here eigenvalue. Here's my linear operator. Here's a weight, and I've got myself a nice eigenvalue problem. Now something that I didn't talk about as we sort of went through these two examples was there's also boundary conditions that I have to consider here. The problem technically is not complete until you have boundary conditions added. I just wanted to show you what these, or how these sort of things show up. Now, as it turns out, we can actually prove that there are solutions to these things. In general, finding those solutions are very, very difficult, but 
we can use some clever mathematical analysis that I'm going to show you in the next video and analyze these things and in particular say something useful about these time equations because really what we care about is the long time dynamics. Do things decay? Do they average out? You know, do you get a, a weird temperature distribution or a weird vibration pattern as time goes on? These are all questions that we ask ourselves based on this time part of the separation of variables, but it all comes from the eigenvalue, which comes from this eigenvalue problem. So in the next video, we're going to do some theory here. We're going to learn about Sturm-Liouville eigenvalue problems. So I'll see you all in the next video, everybody.